Kaczynski, the chair of the Department of Orthopedics and Sports Medicine. And I want to uh, particularly, uh, before we start, uh, thank Planet um, as well as Aaron uh, and Jason uh, for helping uh, set up Grand Rounds this morning and for all the work they've been doing to help keep the department and the residency running. Um, I have uh, special kudos, uh, which this morning will go out to everybody. Uh, people have really been doing a great job, and I appreciate the uh, courage that uh, people are, are displaying who are taking care of patients at uh, some real risk to their own health. So thank you, everybody. I also want to thank Jackie Dunahoe and Paul Manor for putting together an excellent um, total joint conference uh, yesterday morning that some of us uh, participated in. And with that, I'm going to introduce our uh, guest speakers for Grand Rounds this morning. Um, Kenneth Chin is a clinical assistant professor in the Department of Orthopedics and Sports Medicine. And Dr. Chin um, had fellowship training in both um, foot and ankle surgery as well as um, sports surgery. And Aditya Yerapragada is our um, excellent R4 um, who has an interest in foot and ankle surgery. And this morning they're going to be talking to us about uh, the role of arthroscopy in the evaluation and treatment of ankle fractures. So thank you. All right, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm going to start by sharing my screen. Perfect. So um, this morning, Dr. Chin and I will discuss utilizing uh, ankle arthroscopy in the management of acute ankle fractures. Um, everyone's exposure to ankle arthroscopy is relatively variable. So I'll provide a brief introduction into ankle arthroscopy and Dr. Chin will follow um, with discussions in detail about the existing literature indications and uh, and with several case presentations about ankle arthroscopy as an adjunct to ankle fracture fixation. Uh, and of course I have no disclosures. So I will begin by talking about the history of ankle arthroscopy, outline some of the indications and contraindications, uh, describe a little bit of technical points, um, and then discuss complications before turning over to Dr. Chin. So um, history. Um, Dr. Kenji Takagi, back in 1918, um, wrote a publication called The Arthroscope, where he first described using arthroscopy in cadaver knees using a cystoscope. Um, he actually called this first attempt a failure and spent the next several years trying to modify and improve upon this concept. In 1925, Kruscher um, is the first American to, re to report the use of arthroscopy in the knee, um, and he used arthroscopy to diagnose and treat meniscal disorders. Six years later, um, Dr. Berman, um, with the Hospital of Joint Disease in New York, um, reports uh, arthroscopic examination of multiple joints in a cadaver. But at the time, he believed the ankle was not suitable for arthroscopy because the joint space he considered was too narrow. Uh, and as you can see here, here's a picture of what uh, arthroscopy used to be back in the early 1900s, where without the use of our fiber optic cables and our monitors, you had to directly visualize the knee joint or any joint um, with your eyes, with, which was um, pretty, pretty incredible. A few years later, um, Dr. Kenji Takagi published the first standardized method of arthroscopic examination of the ankle. He describes two puncture sites, um, which we now refer to our anterolateral anteromedial portals, um, but his description is very generalized. He essentially only described that the joint space of the ankle must be filled with either fluid or gas, and he describes that traction is rarely needed to evaluate the ankle joint. Beyond that, he does not describe any detailed surgical anatomy or any other portal placement. So we'll fast forward to 1972 um, when Dr. Masaki Watanabe, who's widely considered to be the father, father of arthroscopy, he publishes a report on 28 ankle arthroscopies, and he's the first to use fiber optic uh, arthroscopy to visualize um, joints, not just the ankle. 
Um, he's also the first um, to describe posterior ankle portal placement, which helped with his visualization and access to the ankle. A few years later, Y.C. Chen um, published a report on 67 clinical and 17 cadaveric ankle arthroscopies, um, which he described in detail the different compartments within the ankle and was credited as the first to provide an extensive description of the surgical anatomy within the ankle joint. Since that time, the clinical experience of ankle arthroscopy has significantly increased. Um, arthroscopic techniques have advanced further um, with the development of small joint instrumentation, and the indications continue to expand throughout the foot and ankle, with expansion into arthroscopy of smaller joints, such as the subtalar joint or even the great toe, and the expansion into tendoscopy with scoping of the Achilles tendon and or the FHL tendon as well. So with that, I'll move on to some indications and contraindications for ankle arthroscopy. So a common indication for ankle arthroscopy is soft tissue injury and impingement. Um, typically, most commonly anterolateral with injury to the ATFL or the AITFL resulting in impingement after soft tissue injury with ankle range of motion. You can also find impingement uh, anteromedially secondary to deltoid or medial capsule injury as well as posteriorly secondary to posterior, posterior capsule or PITFL injury. And typically, treatment of this involves debridement and or repair of the injured structures noted. Similarly, you can have bony impingement secondary to osteophytes or ossicles and depending on the location can have severe limitations in ankle joint range of motion. As you can see in the uh, image provided, anterior tibial or anterior tailor osteophytes can cause significant limitations in ankle dorsiflexion. These, these osteophytes or ossicles can be secondary to trauma or other inflammatory processes, and treatment typically involves resection and or debridement to help treat the uh, issue. Another common indication for ankle arthroscopy is instability, and it's typically lateral or syndesmotic, but other locations have been found as well. And the role of ankle arthroscopy here is to, prior to addressing the ankle instability, is to evaluate the joint for intraarticular pathology, which can be present in up to 90% of cases. The arthroscopy allows for direct visualization of the joint before and after reduction. And while gold standard treatment for these types of instability is open stabilization, be it a reconstruction of the lateral ankle ligaments or syndesmotic fixation, uh, there's an increasing prevalence of arthroscopic assisted techniques to um, evaluate the joint prior to and assist with fixation at the same time. Another indication that we typically use and see ankle arthroscopy for is end-stage arthritis requiring fusion. Um, gold standard for ankle arthrodesis is still open to tibiotalar arthrodesis. However, arthroscopic assisted techniques are becoming more prevalent as well. These techniques have a relatively low complication rate and better cosmesis. However, it is very difficult to correct significant deformity with arthroscopic ankle fusion and are reserved for um, relatively small deformity correction. The goal is to prepare the joint with minimal soft tissue disruption and then apply percutaneous fixation to minimize the soft tissue dissection as you can see here from the images provided. Additionally, osteochondral injuries of both the tibia and the talus are very typically treated uh, and diagnosed with ankle arthroscopy. Arthroscopy, as you might imagine, provides direct visualization of the lesion without large soft tissue dissection, and at the same time, allows us to administer arth arthroscopic treatment. There are various treatment measures depending on the size and the character of the lesion, whether it be primary repair, lavage and or, and or debridement, marrow inducing reparative techniques such as drilling or microfracture, or restorative techniques such as osteochondral autograft, osteochondral allograft, or autologous chondrocyte implantation, depending again on the characteristics of the lesion. Other indications for ankle arthroscopy include synovitis, both traumatic and non-traumatic, septic arthritis, intraarticular biopsy for lesions of unknown uh, character, 
loose body removals, tendinitis, arthrofibrosis, uh, or even diagnostic ankle arthroscopy in the setting of unexplained pain, swelling, or mechanical symptoms. And of course, uh, assistance with fracture fixation, as we'll go into more detail um, following this talk. Some contraindications for ankle arthroscopy. Absolute contraindications include localized soft tissue infection with the concern that uh, uh, this could potentially seed the joint, resulting in aseptic arthritis, and severe degenerative joint disease that where there isn't enough joint space to enter the joint and or not enough range of motion to properly assess the joint. Relative contraindications include severe edema, making it difficult for um, skin incision and or closure, tenuous vascular status, and uh, complex regional pain syndrome, which has been shown to result in an increased post-operative post -operative complication rate. So I'll briefly go over some basic technique points regarding ankle arthroscopy. And I'll start with some of the equipment that is utilized. So typically, a 1.9 millimeter or a 2.7 millimeter arthroscope is used to visualize the ankle joint. Rarely is a 4.0 millimeter scope used as the large size prevents safe maneuverability within the joint. Uh, either a 30 degree or a 7 degree, 70 degree obliquity, obliquity field of vision is used. And the 70 degree is particularly helpful in seeing over the medial or lateral tailored domes into the gutters. But as you might imagine, the 70 degree obliquity scope has a central blind spot, making it more challenging to navigate the joint safely without, without causing iatrogenic cartilage injury. Other small joint instruments, such as the 202935 millimeter shavers or burrs, the 1.5 millimeter probes, 3545 millimeter curettes, and 29 or 35 millimeter graspers are used, in addition to other pathology specific instruments to treat and diagnose different pathologies within the ankle. Additionally, in order to improve visualization, ankle distractors are often used to help visualize the joint better. Without distraction, certain areas of the ankle are not attainable, such as the central plafond and or central tailor dome and some posterior structures. Um, and there have in the past been different types of ankle distractors used. Initially, invasive distractors such as pins in the tibia and talus androcalcaneus have been used to distract the joint, but as you might imagine, these have fallen out of favor recently due to complications, particularly neurovascular injury, infection, and or fractures. Uh, additionally, it's been shown that the amount of distraction is similar um, with invasive distractors as with non-invasive, so the trend nowadays has shifted to non-invasive distraction. And there's a couple of types of non-invasive distraction, whether it be uncontrolled with manual distraction or gravity or controlled as demonstrated here in the figure above. Contraindications distraction uh, include complex regional pain syndrome, as well as an op open tibial physis, which may result in growth arrest at the distal tibia. Uh, current recommendations uh, in the literature recommend the, to limit the distraction force to less than 30 pounds for less than one hour to decrease the risk of neurovascular injury. Once you have your type of distraction um, determined, um, then it's a matter of uh, looking at portal placement. So there are two workhorse portals in the ankle, the anterior medial and the anterior lateral portal. The anterior medial portal is just medial to the tibialis anterior tendon at the level of the joint, being sure to avoid the saphenous vein and nerve and the anterolateral portal is placed just lateral to peroneus tertius, tertius uh, making sure to avoid the superficial perineal nerve. A good way to avoid the superficial perineal nerve is that in most patients that do not have significant edema, you can actually trace or outline the path of the SPN as it crosses laterally across the ankle joint. And of course, the biggest thing is to use the nick and spread technique where you incise the skin, use some kind of blunt dissection tool to dissect the soft tissue before making your ankle arthrotomy and not just blindly incising the skin directly into the ankle joint. These portals can be used to address the majority of the pathology within the joint and can be used as either inflow or outflow. A common third portal placement um, is the posterior lateral portal, which is a, um, utilized again as for visualization or outflow, and is just placed 
uh, just lateral to the Achilles tendon in the soft spot about one centimeter above the tip of the fibula, being sure to avoid the sural nerve as well as a small saphenous vein. There are multiple other port accessory portals that are used, um, as described here, the anterior central, medial midline, posterior central, posterior medial, transmalleolar or transtalar. Um, and each of these, however, are not used as commonly and come with their own risk of complication, particularly neurovascular. But depending on the pathology um, and the treatment you're trying to apply, these can provide easier access and better exposure to different aspects of the ankle joint. So lastly, I'll touch briefly on some complications. The overall complication rate for ankle arthroscopy itself, independent of uh, pathology, is somewhere between 3.4 to 17% uh, in the literature. And the overwhelmingly um, most common complication is neurovascular injury, particularly the superficial perineal nerve. And that's primarily done during the um, uh, making of the anterolateral portal. Other complications include infection, arthrofibrosis, fracture, ligament injury, and incisional pain, but the, the risk of the SPN is by far the highest uh, when it comes to ankle arthroscopy. So at this point, I will turn it over to Dr. Chin, who will go into more detail about utilizing arthroscopy in the treatment of acute ankle fractures. Thank you. Thanks, Aditya. That was a great overview of the uh, ankle arthroscopy. And I want to thank Dr. Chansky and Dr. Turrell for inviting me uh, for the privilege to share my thoughts and speak about um, a topic that's near and dear to my heart. And thank you to Planette, Jason, and Aaron for setting this up. And thanks for everyone for joining us under these unusual circumstances. All right, so today we're going to talk about utilizing arthroscopy in the treatment of acute ankle fractures. I have no disclosures to discuss. And today our object objectives are to briefly review ankle fractures, take a look at the existing literature of using arthroscopy as an adjunct to open reduction and internal fixation, my personal indications to utilize arthroscopy, and we're gonna go through a few cases. So ankle fractures are a very common injury. Um, most commonly, it's a unimalleolar, so a lateral malleolus or medial malleolus fracture the majority of the time, but uh, bimalleolar and trimalleolar fractures are also very common. There are similar rates between men and women who, um, who sustain this injury. In young patients, uh, there are a higher rate in men who often engage in high energy athletics or activities. In older patients, there's a higher rate in female patients, uh, likely due to fragility fracture patterns. And in orthopedic residency, we learn about all these classifications. Here's a laggy Hansen classification, uh, which we all know. And also the Danny Weber classification, which describes the ankle fractures in the location of the fibula fracture. So how do ankle fractures do? So this was a study done out of Europe in 2011 that showed the long-term outcomes of operatively treated ankle fractures, almost 2,000 ankle fractures. And what they showed was that reduction really matters. <clears throat> so in patients who had a really, really good reduction, almost 80% did really well, good or excellent. Um, but in poor reductions, um, a quarter, only a quarter of patients did well. And what matters is why, why are only, if we do a great job of reducing these fractures, why are only 80% of them doing well? Is there an injury um, that we can't fix at the, t at the time of the injury, the chondral injury? Um, is there something else going on? So what they saw was that uh, if there was a concurrent cartilage injury, uh, patients did a lot worse than patients without cartilage injuries. So why would you scope at the time of ankle fr fracture fixation? Well, you know, based on that prior study, would it help us identify a chondral injury so we can help to either treat it or prognosticate patients? So has arthroscopy used elsewhere in the body for fracture fixation or visualization? Yes. So it's been used in the knee for tibial plateau fractures, um, in the wrist for distal radius fractures for arthroscopic assisted reduction, in the elbow for diagnosing and treating radial head fractures, 
And in the shoulder, treating greater tuberosity fracture of the proximal humerus. So now we're gonna dive into some of the literature regarding using ankle arthroscopy in the treatment of acute fractures. Uh, in JBJS British in 2000, another study out of Europe was a prospective study of over 200 patients. And they showed that um, when they scoped their ankle fractures, um, they took a look inside the joint and they showed that 80, almost 80% 80 of patients had at least a low grade cartilage injury. Now this is variable to a very superficial scuff, grade one, all the way up to full thickness, grade four injuries. And they found that it was more common in AO type C fractures versus B fractures. And their most common complication was superficial perineal nerve neuritis. Another study out of Southern California in 2002 looked uh, at a similar cohort of patients. This is a prospective case study uh, series of almost 50 unstable ankle fractures. And 63% of the patients had chondral injuries that were more than five millimeters. And they found the highest rates in patients with either syndesmotic injuries or Weber C injuries. And we'll come back to these numbers later. In 2009, in JBJS out of HSS, there was a retrospective review of 84 ankle ORIFs, which also utilized arthroscopy as an adjunct. And again, they came back to this uh, number of 63% with uh, chondral injury, the Taylor Dome being the most commonly injured structure, followed by the um, lateral malleolus, and supination external rotation and pronation external rotation for injuries had the highest rate of chondral injuries, which you'd probably expect um, the higher energy mechanism, uh, energy, um, the higher rate of chondral injury. A study out of China did a systematic review of 10 studies, which pooled almost 800 operative ankle fractures, which also use ankle arthroscopy. And oddly enough, they came back to this weird number of 63% of chondral lesions. And their most common complications was SPN neuritis, synovial cysts, and one case of compartment syndrome from fluid extravasation. How about randomized control trials? Well, I came across two of them in the literature. The first one was a small study out of the University of Southern California in 2001. This was a prospective RCT of 19 patients. Now this was just lateral malleolus fractures, so um, lower energy fractures. And um, they found no difference in scores at a follow-up of 21 months. Um, but of course, this is only lateral malleolus fractures and it's a pretty small um, cohort of patients. In 2004, there was a study out of the Journal of Trauma in Japan. And this was another prospective study of 72 ankle fractures. 73% um, of the scope group had presence of a chondral injury. And if you look at outcome scores, they used the AOFAS AOFA scores and uh, patients with the arthroscopic assisted ORAF had slightly better um, AOFAS scores at three years. Now the AOFAS score is not a great outcome measure. It's not a validated score. Um, so you can take that with a grain of salt. So what are my, so after looking at the literature and my experience in my training, um, I've come up with some reasons for uh, scoping ankle fractures in my practice. First one is intraarticular loose bodies. Next one is if I suspect any sort of chondral injury, whether that's from a fracture dislocation or a syndesmotic injury. And lastly, it can uh, assist me with assessing my syndesmotic reduction in fractures that I think uh, will need um, syndesmosis fixation. So we'll start with intraarticular loose bodies. So these are small bony fragments that are within the joint, usually acute, but in some cases can be pre-existing. Um, we worry about these because they can cause locking and catching and other mechanical symptoms and can also lead to accelerated articular wear by grinding um, the chondral surfaces. A study in 1996 out of Southern California showed that 55% of ankle fractures, which were scoped at the time of fixation, had a loose body on arthroscopic evaluation. So we're gonna go through a case here. This is a 51 year old female who was knocked over by her dog in her garage. She um, 
tripped over a chair and twisted her left ankle and had immediate pain and deformity. Uh, she's otherwise healthy, besides some anxiety and depression. These are her injury films. And here you can see a trimalleolar ankle fracture with a small posterior malleolus fragment. This is after uh, an excellent reduction in the ER by one of our uh, orthopedic residents. And would we get advanced imaging for this? Well, this being a trimalleolar fracture, uh, I would say most of us who fix these do uh, ask for a CAT scan. This can help characterize the posterior malleolus. We can also find some other clues about the fracture. We can see here on, on these two slices that there's a pretty large loose body in the anterior ankle joint. Here's a 3D reconstruction showing that. And you can imagine that that large piece of bone can cause some early chondral wear on the Taylor dome or the distal tibial surface and can cause some mechanical symptoms. So I talked to her about scoping the ankle first to debreed and remove those loose bodies, followed by a standard open reduction internal fixation. So we started by scoping, and we can see here on the medial Taylor dome, there was this um, just diffuse wear, whether that was pre-existing or if it was new from either her injury or her from her reduction maneuver, I'm not sure, but it also helps me to prognosticate this patient to tell her that, hey, there was a little bit of articular wear in there, and you may be at risk for getting some post-traumatic arthritis in your ankle down the line. We saw this smaller osteochondral fragment that wasn't on the CAT scan. This one was mostly made of cartilage, so um, it didn't show up on the CAT scan. And then here was that large piece that we saw on the CT scan that was in the anterior ankle joint. Sorry. Of course, you'd want to get this out. We don't want to cause any early articular wear. And these are, this is what we found in there. This is that large piece that we saw on the CAT scan, and there were these, these two small chondral fragments that weren't picked up on the CAT scan. We then followed with standard open reduction and internal fixation with an anti-glide plate for the distal fibula, two cannulated screws for the medial malleolus, and a posterior to anterior uh, posterior malleolus screw. Fracture dislocations. Pretty commonly seen in high energy mechanisms. We often think about athletic injuries that cause um, high energy injuries, and we often think of football or basketball, but um, golf is also pretty dangerous. And now at the seventh hole, this was just a moment ago, Tony Finau. His wife and four children with him. Oh, you hurt yourself. So he did his own reduction. I found out later that he played the rest of that round of golf, but uh, <laughs> which is kind of crazy. So uh, fracture dislocations have a high rate of chondral injury, either from the initial injury or from the actual reduction maneuver. It's hard to say which one is coming from. A study uh, out of HSS in 2015 showed a retrospective case series of uh, over 100 arthroscopic assisted ankle RIFs, and they showed 43% of their patients had a full thickness Taylor chondral injury. But what they also found was that 20 out of 20 or 100% of their fracture dislocation patients had a full thickness chondral injury. So this tells me that uh, maybe these fracture dislocations, we should scope them. And in young active patients, um, I think it's a good idea to scope these patients prior to fixation to assess their cartilage, either for intervention or just for uh, prognostic purposes. Here's another case. This is a 48-year-old female who fell and twisted her ankle while hiking. She's otherwise healthy. She was seen in the emergency department with this uh, lateral fracture dislocation. 
She was reduced. She has a very small posterior malleolus fracture fragment there. Um, so we got a CAT scan preoperatively. Um, the posterior malleolus is very small. There were no loose bodies. Um, I did talk to her about the risk of chondral injury with um, fracture dislocation. So we decided to scope first. And we saw this small lateral Taylor dome lesion. Um, it was pretty small and not full thickness. It was only about 75%. Um, so we just debrided the loose edge with a shaver. And we also saw some diffuse wear over the Taylor dome. So in this patient, we didn't have to do any intervention besides just a little bit of shaving, um, but it also helped me to prognosticate the patient, can counsel her down the line if uh, she does develop post-traumatic arthritis. We followed that with um, open reduction internal fixation. Her posterior malleolus fracture fragment was very small, so we did not fix it, and she was her syndesmosis was stable at the end. And um, now we're going to go over syndesmotic injuries. With syndesmotic injuries, we have a high suspicion for concurrent cartilage injury, as shown in those previous studies um, in the beginning of this talk. And it can also help me in assessing our syndesmotic reduction when we're doing syndesmosis fixation. So we know from previous studies that we're not very good at reducing the syndesmosis. Dr. Gardner in uh, FAI 2006 did a retrospective review of 25 of his um, ankle fractures that requires tenismotic fixation, and um, a quarter of them had some tib-fib diastasis, and a little over half of them were malreduced on post-operative CAT scan. That's quite high. Dr. Saji in 2012 had a prospective study of 68 of his ankle fractures that requires tenismotic fixation, and about 40% were malreduced on post-operative CAT scan. So two out of five patients were malreduced. And he recommended open reduction of syndesmotic injuries. And in those, even in those open reductions, 15% uh, were malreduced. So how can we make these syndesmotic reductions better? There's a couple of tools in our toolbox. Number one is to get contralateral x-rays that can be a a nice control to try to mimic. Performing an open reduction, as Dr. Saji suggested. Utilizing O-arm. I know some of our trauma co uh, colleagues at Harborview um, use the O-arm when treating syndesmosis injuries. And that can be an amazing tool for uh, confirming your reduction. And lastly, can arthroscopy be used? So there's a study out of Baltimore showing that, um, showing a cadaveric study and showing that using a three millimeter probe can be highly predictive of a syndesmotic disruption and can help with your reduction. Another study out of Japan um, found that arth arthroscopy was more predictive compared to x-rays when uh, diagnosing a syndesmosis injury. So we're gonna go through another case here. This is a 20 year old male. He's a college student in Arizona and rugby player. He had a rugby injury while in Arizona and he unfortunately injured his ankle. He underwent acute open reduction internal fixation by the oncle orthopedist in Arizona. He's from Seattle, so he came home for the summer and came here for his routine follow-up. He came back to me for his two-week follow-up. We found, um, I got routine post-op x-rays on him, and because I didn't know the surgeon, I decided to get uh, stress radiographs, and we found that he did um, open up his medial clear space here. Here is our stress views from the day of, the, uh, day of surgery, and here you can see the medial clear space widening. And you can see the surgeon did a decent job of his fibula, um, getting him out to length and fixing it with a two lag screw technique and a neutralization plate. So I started with scoping him, but then I um, started syndesmotic fixation with a suture button construct. And my apologies, due to coronavirus, we can't, I couldn't get into the OR to find the arthroscopy tower to find his 
arthroscopy pictures. But this is a typical finding we, we would see. We would see a picture of the syndesmosis, and um, in this patient's case, we could we saw that the syndesmosis was closed down in the coronal plane, but there was still a lot of sagittal um, instability. So there was a lot of anterior to posterior instability that I could see on um, arthroscopy. Um, so I decided to add a second point of fixation with a position screw. And that eliminated the anterior to posterior translation of the fibula. Here he is at six months, uh, back to doing everything, playing rugby and running. Another case, this is a 28 year old male who fell down the hill while running. He was trying to catch the kickoff for a Huskies football game. He twisted his left ankle and had immediate pain and inability to bear weight. He's a healthy medical student. He went to the ER and had some x-rays taken of his ankle. And we could see just some subtle medial clear space widening on this non-weight bearing x-ray. His tib fib x-ray shows this mid shaft fibular fracture. And on this tib fib x-rays, we can also uh, get another glimpse of that medial clear space widening. So I talked to him about his injury, um, about his high fibular fracture, his syndesmotic injury, and his risk for cartilage injury at the time. So we talked about um, scoping his ankle to evaluate the cartilage and uh, also evaluating his fibular fracture. Uh, we would stress it under anesthesia fluoroscopically and see if it was length stable. And if it was length stable, um, we would forego fixation and just address the syndesmosis in isolation. So for, of course, we began with contralateral x-rays. We started with a scope. He, there was a large hemarthrosis that we had to irrigate and to breed. We did see that there was um, diastasis of his syndesmosis here, which we expected, but what we didn't expect was some central wear and tear of his Taylor dome. Another un unexpected finding was his medial Taylor dome. There was this full thickness osteochondral defect. Um, and now there's some controversy over these. Some folks say that um, a lot of these medial Taylor dome lesions are incidental findings that are in some patients just part of their anatomy and often bilateral. Um, but for this patient, this was acute. We saw a large cartilage uh, fragment floating around there. So we uh, microfractured this, uh, this lesion. We then proceeded with uh, EUA of his distal fibula. Um, what I did was I put a uh, lobster claw clamp on his distal fibula and placed flora over the fracture site, and it was immobile. It was not moving uh, either length or rotation. So we decided to just proceed with syndesmotic fixation. I started with um, a single suture button construct, and like the prior case, I scoped it afterwards saw that it was stable, and then added a second suture button construct. He was stress negative, compared it with the contralateral side. And reinserted the arthroscopy uh, camera and saw that the syndesmosis was indeed closed down and stress negative. Here he is at three months with good callus formation of his fibula and maintained alignment of his syndesmosis. So what are the downsides of arthroscopy? It's not benign. As Aditya discussed before, there are some complications. So this is a study uh, out of Europe in 2012 discussing the complications in ankle arthroscopy. And this was a retrospective review of over 1,300 ankle arthroscopy cases. And they went through the most common complications. Like Aditya discussed, the most common one is by far the uh, neurological injury, and that's the superficial perineal nerve. And like he discussed, 
what I do is I examine these patients preoperatively and try to palpate their SPN. And I mark it heavily with a marking pen prior to prep. And um, it can it serves um, as a point to avoid during your arthroscopy. There's also risk of superficial infection, sinus tract, deep infection, even broken instruments, and pulmonary, pulmonary embolism. So it's not benign. So should we scope all our ankle fractures? There are actually some surgeons out there that scope all their ankle fractures. They say that in some studies, it's up to um, almost 80% of ankle fractures have chondral injury. I think that's a bit aggressive. So I don't scope all my ankle fractures, only select numbers of them. I don't scope if it's an open injury or if you're concerned about soft tissue compromise, whether if it's from uh, extensive swelling or if you're concerned about the patient's skin, uh, if they're diabetic or have venous stasis changes, or if it's an older patient that you just um, want, them, want to get them off the table and you don't want to spend the extra time um, doing the arthroscopy. I do scope if it's a young active patients, in these young active patients that have either a loose body, fracture dislocation, or a known syndesmotic injury, because we know that these have a high rate of chondral injuries. So here's been my experience so far. I've been here for a little bit over one year at UW, and I've fixed 46 ankle fractures, and nine of them use ankle arthroscopy. So about 20% of my ankle fracture cases have used ankle arthroscopy as an adjunct. So do I think that it's a must do like some surgeons do where they scope all their ankle fractures? No, I don't think so. I think it's a, a nice tool to have in your toolbox to use if you suspect a chondral injury or if you want to use it to remove a loose body um, or to assess and aid your syndesmotic reduction. So thank you again for your time. I uh, welcome any questions at this point. Yeah, Ken and Aditya, thank you. Um, I don't I don't have any questions, but that was a great talk. What, what do you, I, I guess one question, Ken, is um, 46 ankle fractures in your first year, and that number should probably go up. Um, are you going to um, try to study the role of ankle arthroscopy in ankle fractures? So it's been pretty well studied. I think, I think doing a, a the, the gap in the literature right now is probably the prospective stuff. There's a lot of retrospective reviews on these ankle arthroscopy in ankle fractures, but the prospective, I think, is lacking. There was that small group, um, the only 19 patients in, um, in 2001, so I don't think that was adequate. Um, there was that larger RCT out of Japan, but I think there's some room for um, an RCT. I think that can, that can help us a lot and give us some new information. Um, whether or not this actually helps patients long term, or if it just helps us um, prognosticate them. Uh, I have a question, Ken, if you don't mind. This is sure. Jeff Power. Um, is there an RVU incentive to scope? Uh, is there a different code that you use? So if you fix an ankle fracture without scoping and with scoping, is there a difference in your RVUs? There is. So that's that's a good point. And that's why I don't use it that much. So it costs the healthcare system and the patient more money to do this. Um, typically, it's you treat it with um, a CPT called ankle arthroscopy with either extensive debridement or a limited debridement, um, which does add to the cost to the healthcare system and the patient. Um, and there's other codes if you find an osteochondral defect or if there's a loose body. So it definitely adds to the, to the cost of things, which is why I try to only use it where I think it's going to be useful. And you're probably pretty facile at it and everybody that you work with may be facile at it. How much time though, if you were just to go in and do a limited debridement, I'm just curious with how good you guys are, how much time does that add to a case? So I think if you're relatively facile with it, it doesn't add a whole lot. A limited debridement, if you're just doing a peek and look and if there's not much in there, um, you don't identify any chondral defects that need any intervention. It's about five minutes, Great, 10 minutes you. at the most. If it could save you from getting a preoperative CT scan, uh, that might be one way of neutralizing that additional cost, shifting it, shifting it to the surgeon as opposed to uh, radiology in the hospital. That's true. So I think it would it would help um, in patients who have a fracture dislocation, but you don't see any loose bodies on the 
um, x-rays and you don't see a posterior malleolus fracture, I still think we need a CAT scan for the posterior mal fractures. We need those for um, fixation strategies. Um, but in the absence of that, I think it can avoid a CAT scan and possibly offset some of that cost. Thanks. Hey, Ken, this is Jonah. Hey, Jonah. Hey, uh, great talk. You know, the um, synesmosis is sort of a, a very close uh, subject to my heart as well. The problem with some of those studies that you showed with the malreduction, and I, and I talked to Mike about this a lot, is they didn't really have a good way of evaluating what was a reduction or not back in the study. So if you look back at their CTs, anything that was side to side two millimeter difference was considered a malreduction. And, you know, having looked at hundreds and hundreds of CT scans for these, um, for research studies, you know, the average in some people is 1.5 to two, two millimeters different side to side. So um, I think it's really hard to know what's reduced and what isn't reduced without bilateral CT scans. And so I'm wondering when, you know, even when doing an open reduction like Saji uh, talked about, people have described malreduction because you can malrotate it even if you're looking at the front. How do you think the addition of arthroscopy changes? And then would you see a benefit then to using some sort of intraoperative 3D imaging to help assess that or not? Yeah, so I think you're right. So synesmotic treatment, postoperative reduction, and management is very controversial right now and it's hard we we were not very good at either assessing it and treating it um and and we also don't even know if it matters right a lot of these patients are malreduced and they're doing just fine um so to get back to your question i think um using arthroscopy is not a gold standard by any means i think it's another tool in the toolbox to use in helping with our reduction and you, i still get the contralateral x-rays um, I think in the badly displaced ones, using an open reduction makes sense. And in my case, I don't have the luxury of an uh, 3D intraoperative CAT scan, uh, but that is an amazing tool. And that's probably the best tool that you can have to get your reduction perfect for these. Um, so for me, it's just an extra thing to help with my reduction and just helps my odds of getting it right. Any more questions? Hey, Ken, I have a question. This is Chelsea. Hey, Chelsea. Um, so when you're assessing the syndesmosis um, with arthroscopy, does the traction device get in your way? Does it change the position of the ankle? How do you manage that? So I, uh, after my syndesmotic fixation and fracture fixation, I don't put the ankle back in the distractor. I think it could tug on your fixation, and it can also possibly influence your reduction. So I don't use the traction device. I try to get into the joint um, with just some plantar flexion of the ankle to open up the anterior space, just manual um, plantar flexion, and just take a look without traction because I think it can, um, it can cloud your judgment of the reduction and, and affect it. Thank you. And I'm looking for, I use the, uh, the arthroscopic probe to see if there's any diastasis of the synesmosis and also doing a external rotation stress test and cotton tests uh, arthroscopically as well, in addition to radiographic stress testing. Cool. Okay, I think that's probably it. Uh, uh, Drs. Chin and Yara Pergada, thank you very much. That was excellent. Right. Everybody have a nice day and a good week, and we'll uh, get together with another town hall sometime in the next week or so. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Great job.